morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences of the ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. Welcome to yet another session of very educative lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest from Malaysia, Professor Chi Pin Chi. Professor Chi is a senior consultant in neurosurgery in Glen Eagles Hospital, Kuala Lumpur, Beacon Specialist Hospital, and Pantai Hospital, Kuala Lumpur. He was trained in neurosurgery in Belfast, and he is one of the pioneers of DBS and radiosurgery in Malaysia. He was the past president of the Neurosurgical Association of Malaysia. He was also the past member of the Education Committee of the WFNS. He is a noted author with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars, and today he'll be talking about gamma nephrodia surgery for trigeminal neuralgia. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Madoka Nakajima. Professor Nakajima is a professor at the Department of Neurosurgery at the Chuntendo University, Tokyo, Japan. Professor Nakajima is a member of the Japanese Hydrocephalus Society as well as Japan Society of Neuroendoscopy. His specialties include functional neurosurgery, epilepsy surgery, and hydrocephalus. He was the first author of the guidelines of management of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus, third edition endorsed by the Japan Society of Normal Pressure Hydrocephalus. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars, and today he'll be talking about lumbar peritoneal chain for idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Motohiro Hayashi. Professor Hayashi is the director of Gamma Knife Unit at the Tokyo Women's Medical University, and he also serves as the associate Professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Tokyo Women's Medical University. He is also Director of Radio Surgery Section at the Medical Innovation Laboratory, Tokyo Women's Medical University, and Waseda University. Professor Hayashi was the past president of the Radio Surgery Committee of the WFNS and has also served as a member of the board of the Radio Surgery Committee of the WFNS. He is the founder of the Asian Gamma Knife Academic Training Program, and we are extremely honored and thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Chi Pinchi. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest and senior faculty from Saudi Arabia, Professor Ahmad Damar. Professor Amar is a professor and head of Department of Neurosurgery at the King Faisal Health University Hospital, Dabam, Saudi Arabia. He is a vastly experienced neurosurgeon who has conducted more than 6,000 surgeries. He is a noted author who has written one of the most famous books in neurosurgery titled Hydrocephalus, What We Know and What We Still Do Not Know. He serves on the editorial board of several internationally reputed neurosurgery journals. He is also the recipient of several awards and honors from the Saudi government for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgery. He is currently the co-chairman of the WFNS Ethics Committee, and we are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Madoka Nakajima. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the chairs and speakers to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on WeChat. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to our first chair, Professor Motohiro Hayashi. Thank you, Rajas. So now we'd like to start on the first session concerning gamma radio surgery for trigeminal neuralgia. So when we have the patient with trigeminal neuralgia, so usually uh, we consider operations such as MBD or something taking the tegretol. But elderly patients or high complication patients uh, operation and cannot be done. The time, so we have the uh, one another choice in the radio surgery for trigeminal neuralgia. So now we have a lot of papers from from the world. Uh, the clinical result was not so bad, but so uh, the results depending on the centers, the treatment strategy methodology is depending on the, the site situations. So uh, we have a lot of discussion uh, about radio surgery for trigeminal neuralgia indication results. So today we'd like to welcome the Dr. Chi. Uh, he had a lot of experience with radio surgery for trigeminal neuralgia. So now we'd like to listen to the uh, lectures from Dr. Chi. Dr. Chi, please. Well, welcome. Today my topic is on uh, gamma knife radio surgery. On uh, trigeminal neuralgia. The, uh, as we understand, patient with trigeminal neuralgia present with uh, facial pain, usually described as sharp stabbing or sometimes knifing. In some patients, they present like the uh, experience of electrical shock over the face 
some of them are jabbing in nature. The pain is usually intermittent and is not constant. The, uh, if the patients uh, complain of pain, which is uh, burning, aching, or boring, or crawling in nature, then we have to think about some other diagnosis um, uh, other than trigeminal neuralgia. Now, the ideal goal of treatment of trigeminal neuralgia is to treat the cause, like the microvascular decompression, which is the decompressing the small blood vessel causing pulsation on the uh, trigeminal nerves. Uh, that's the ideal situation. Uh, but uh, only about three quarter of patients have uh, blood vessels that are really the cause of uh, trigeminal neuralgia. The ideal goal is to achieve pain relief in a rapid way and on a long-term basis. And also with any procedure, is to preserve the normal facial sensation. Uh, what are the treatment options of trigeminal neuralgia? These include uh, medications, surgical or radiosurgical. Now, the medical treatment of trigeminal neuralgia has been on for a long time. Uh, physician neurologist has been treating with a couple of medications which has seen, seems to be uh, effective in many cases, unless in intractable cases. Um, the one of them is the carbamazepine, which is very useful in many patients. Um, usually, if the, the patient is on the carbamazepine for long term and high doses, then we will be worried about liver dysfunction. Other cases, we, are, we have to watch out for allergic reactions like uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, which can be life-threatening in nature. Now, to, in other cases, uh, patients might complain of uh, sleepiness or drowsiness. Still, there are other patients that can present with electrolyte imbalance. Like recently, I have a few patients who were admitted because of long-term use of carbamazepine causing hyponatremia, so severe that that had to require admission because of uh, life-threatening situation. Now, the other large group of uh, medication that were used are the gabapentinoid, uh, which inhibits certain calcium channel. These are like pregabalin or gabapentin. Pregabalin is uh, useful in many patients, but some of them complain of sleepiness, sometimes confusion, and the memory can be affected. Uh, in some patients, the motor coordination might be affected. Others might complain of dry mouth or blood vision. Of course, there are some patients that uh, occasionally complain of weight gain, which is not ideal for ladies. Now, gabapentin is uh, useful as well, although some patients complain of sleepiness and dizziness. And uh, with prolonged use, we are worried about increased risk of possible uh, tendency to suicide. Some patients can develop aggressive behavior. Others might develop uh, blood uh, changes like isnophilia. Now, the, the other medications include the antidepressant, which can be used in conjunction with other medications as described, and uh, they can be used in such a way that uh, they achieve the maximum effect of pain control in some of these patients. The surgical treatment of trigeminal neuralgia, uh, what are the options? The commonest now is the microvascular decompression where the small blood vessel were dissected away from the trigeminal nerves and kept it from coming back again to compress on the nerve with the insertion of a, a Teflon sponge. This seems to be effective in more than 90% of cases, and, but it requires anesthesia and is still an operation. Um, 
The other capacity includes the radio frequency lesioning with thermal coagulation, glycerol injection, balloon microcompression, uh, which has been described recently by the Chinese neurosurgeon on the ACNS uh, webinar. The surgical section of the nerve has, uh, has been an old procedure and is no more practiced as the patient might develop um, disabling and or pain or troublesome type of numbness of the face. The worst scenario might be that a uh, patient might be having a numb face and yet it's painful. Now the radio surgery uh, treatment of uh, trigeminal neuralgia, um, we can use either gamma knife or cyber knife. Gamma knife where we use a gamma ray with whereas uh, cyber knife, we, it is a micro type of system. The, Treatment of uh, radio surgery in trigeminal neuralgia is to correct the effective transmission or short circuit in the nerve at the site of vascular compression. Um, it's the same as a microvascular decompression uh, where the nerves have been decompressed. In radio surgery, um, the nerve is irradiated and uh, although it's supposed to be um, uh, having an effect, radiation effect, we hope that actually, and we believe that the real mechanism is modulation. The keys to trigeminal neuralgia radio surgery depends on precise anatomic targeting of the trigeminal nerve uh, using selective uh, sharp irradiation of the target on the nerve. Now, cyberknife uh, can be used for treatment of trigeminal neuralgia, and it has been described in literature. Uh, I've used it uh, since 2005, where a small segment of the trigeminal nerve uh, was treated with about 75 gray. We managed to achieve uh, more than 90% success rate. But the main setback is that about 50% of the patients develop a numbness of the face, sometimes it can be severe and disabling. This is the current hospital where we have gamma knife. Uh, this is the first hospital to acquire gamma knife in Malaysia since 2014. Uh, it was initially the perfection gamma knife, later on it was changed to icon. In gamma knife, uh, we depends on uh, 192 radiation beam from the uh, source, the cobalt source, focusing on a very small structure inside the skull or the brain. And uh, the treatment is without uh, any incision and do not really require anesthesia unless in children. Uh, this is muscles. Uh, beautiful port in the southern part of France where my team and I received a training uh, back in uh, before 2014 under Dr. Uh, Professor Regis. We visited the place twice and had a wonderful time there. Now the, this is the uh, scan showing where the gamma knife treatment is. Uh, in this case, with the uh, Regis uh, uh, protocol of uh, retrogesserine zone. Now, what is the biological differential effect of gamma knife on the uh, trigeminal nerve? It is either, it can be necrotic, causing real necrosis on the nerve, or it can be subnecrotic. Um, but uh, we really believe that the most of the effect now on, of gamma knife on the uh, trigeminal nerve uh, in the, in, uh, actually is going through modulation, the change of function of the nerve. Um, of course, there can be no effect as well on the nerve. If 
gamma knife is used to treat uh, the trigeminal nerve in primate. We saw we saw some changes six months later after giving about 80 gray. There are some changes of the uh, nerve bundles having degenerations. Now, how soon the effect will be taken to, to have pain relief in patients? Usually, it takes one to two months to be effective for pain relief. But many weeks after treatment, they can have some pain relief such that the amount of medications that they take has been decreased. Now, there are a few patients that experience complete relief of pain immediately after gamma knife, the actual mechanism of which we are not certain. Uh, gamma knife can achieve good results in more than 90% of cases. If you compare gamma knife against a glycerol injection for the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia, uh, the Hansen uh, reported that uh, gamma knife can achieve better long-term relief of pain and less morbidity, whereas uh, glycerol injection causes more facial numbness and has higher failure rate, but more immediate relief when it's effective. Now, where's the target of treatment in gamma knife uh, treatment of trigeminal neuralgia? It can be distal or proximal. The distal end, distal uh, target is the retro zone practiced by the, the muscles group. And the proximal in other centers, the target is actually proximal at the uh, dorsal root entry zone. Messenger in 2004 recommended uh, that the uh, treatment at the retro zone should be between 5 to 8 millimeter from the brainstem. And Regis in 2006 reported that if the isocenter is less than seven millimeter from the brainstem, the result is better. Uh, been having success of pain relief in 96.6%. And uh, if the distance is longer than nine millimeter, then the result will be less favorable in 72.7%. Uh, again, this is the picture of the uh, treatment of the retro zone. Now, where's the best dose to be given and the target? It's a 90 gray a magic dose. The Marseille's group uh, uses a 90 gray uh, as a standard, a four millimeter collimator. Um, 100% at the retro gasserin uh, zone. And it shows that they have uh, no or minimal facial sensory loss in the patients who were treated. However, other centers are a bit more skeptical. And uh, there's, these include uh, Mayo Clinic, which uh, thinks that the dose will be too high. Of course, it's understandable if the uh, treatment is nearer to the brainstem, uh, causing a higher possible chance of higher facial sensory loss. If we, want, if we study the dose response curve uh, between the response and the dose as given, there are two theoretical curves that we can, we, we have, one is the efficacy curve, the other one is the toxicity curve. With increasing dose, the efficacy increases, but toxicity also might increase. So there has to be a compromise and, uh, of the, the real dose versus efficacy, but also it depends on where is the target. Um, the Regis uh, and other study show that it, uh, and like the study from Park show that the treatment at the retrogesterone zone yielded a greater 
success and fewer complications when compared to the treatment at the dorsal root entry zone. And there are more cases of facial hip anesthesia and dry eye with the dorsal root entry zone between 13 and 8.7% respectively. Although the targets varies from center and center, each center have their own protocol, but we she agreed that there is a higher chance of facial hip anesthesia when the target is close to the brainstem. This is a diagram showing the uh, trigeminal nerve brainstem and the Meckel's cave. We have to understand that the, the nerve, the trigeminal nerve, varies in size. In, in, in uh, length, it presentation it can be shorter or longer and uh, like this uh, diagram then the if this is tr the treatment is at the retrogastrian zone the uh, length of uh, treatment from the brainstem might be more than nine millimeter and the result will be poor just like what is what it was reported by Regis. So in this case, there must be some uh, adjustment for the treatment to be nearer towards the brain stem. Um, in other, in other uh, groups, uh, in certain centers, they are treat in between the dorsal root entry zone and uh, the, uh, uh, somewhere between the dorsal root entry zone and the uh, retrogastrian zone. Uh, the Marcel study of 737 patients using single 4 millimeter collimator with uh, isocenter 7.5 millimeter anterior to the emergence of the fifth nerve, that is the retrogastrian site, uh, at the dose, mean dose of 85 gray, range between 70 to 90 uh, gray. These patients were followed for more than one year. And the result was, was that uh, more than 96% were pain-free after one year. And only 2.8% had hip hypoesthesia of the face. 5.7% showed or had a slight uh, non-painful paresthesia. The recurrence at one year was 14%. So the result actually is very favorable for gamma knife for treatment of trigeminal neuralgia. It has been uh, also been a finding in many centers that the uh, gamma knife uh, actually has a poor result when it's used to treat trigeminal neuralgia, like in cases of multiple sclerosis. The result might be only about 70% of success in pain control. In some patients like diabetes, uh, the result is poorer. So is a patient with uh, uh, atypical phase of pain. We also found that uh, some patients who had a glycerol injection before, the result is poorer. And some patients were complaining of hip anesthesia or more patients complain of hip anesthesia after gamma knife, following failure of glycerol injection. It is also a finding that uh, patients who had microvascular decompression is not faring well after gamma knife uh, radio surgery for trigeminal neuralgia. The duration of symptoms is uh, studied uh, against the outcome after gamma knife for trigeminal neuralgia, uh, Mosabi et al. showed that the best result of pain relief is that the symptoms is less than one year and the result is worse if the symptoms is more than three years from the onset of pain, more so in patients with more than 10 years. Although we had in Malaysia, there are many patients who had more than 10 years symptoms, and we are glad to say that uh, quite a number of patients had good relief. 
uh, other case, we had uh, mega doligo basilar artery and trigeminal neuralgia. If gamma nice is used, it was found that the result is better and is more sustained. And even some patient is pain free up to 10 years. There is also less risk of hypoesthesia experience. Um, now, what if uh, the trigeminal neuralgia recurs after gamma knife treatment? Then we have to go microvascular decompression, or do you like to undergo gamma knife retreatment? Gamma knife retreatment can be done, and uh, this muscle study showed that. Uh, the median time of the uh, retreatment in the series uh, is actually uh, 17 months, range between three to one for six months. Although many of us don't retreat the patient now, at least for at least a year after the initial treatment. There, there was finding that uh, there is a higher chance of pain relief following this second gamma knife treatment for recurrent trigeminal neuralgia. And that uh, also, that uh, there is also higher chance of facial numbness or hypoesthesia, being about 40% in the uh, Regis series. In uh, Kuala Lumpur at Glen Eagles, uh, between May 2014 to October 2021, seven cases of trigeminal neuralgia were treated including one case of dolico megavascular compression. There, is, there was a female preponderance, three to two, age range between 40 to 92 years, and the duration of onset to gamma knife treatment was between two months to 20 years. As we said, there are quite a number of patients who were more than 10 years. The treatment time one hour, and we could achieve a 94.4% success rate at one year in pain relief. One patient developed a numbness over the second division of the fifth nerve, and we could we had minor recurrence in 10%. Three of my, of my personal cases were retreated after two to three years with good results following recurrence. It was also found in many studies that there is a higher chance of pain relief with gamma knife if there is hypoesthesia after treatment, but this is not necessarily so. It was also found that there is, a, you know, after that uh, microvascular decompression and gamma knife was performed uh, for failure of MVD, there is less, less chance of being pain free in this patient. What about second gamma knife treatment for trigeminal neuralgia? Whether this can be done or not? Um, sorry, actually that this, uh, the, the result by Hagesewa show that they, are, they could uh, achieve pain control in 90% of their cases at first year for second gamma knife treatment after recurrence. And uh, at five years, 63% pain free. This in their series of 87 cases being followed for a median time of 30 months after, re after the first treatment. Now, what if uh, gamma, the uh, trigeminal neuralgia recurs again after second treatment of gamma knife? Temple at all, reported 17 cases who had undergone the third gamma knife with initial pain relief being complete about 47%, another 47% some relief. And surprisingly, yeah, the series showed that there was, there was no facial numbness. Um, when follow up, the yeah, group of patients after 23 months, uh, there was still complete uh, pain relief in 35% and a recurrence of 
So in summary, gamma knife surgery is a novel and highly effective modality in the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia. It is non-invasive and precise. There is no need for general anesthesia. The side effect is minimal, and if necessary, it can be repeated. Thank you. Dr. Hayashi. Thank you very much, Dr. Chi. Uh, very nice presentation, and uh, uh, you have a lot of experience, and uh, you have reviewed a lot of papers, and uh, especially you. you mentioned about uh, Professor John Regis, Massey France, and the teams. Uh, you, uh, you know, uh, I was staying in Marseille, France between 1999 and 2001, two years and a half. Oh, I was wow. working with the Professor Regis together. So oh, I, I was, see. I am one of Corinne of uh, Marseille, France. Uh, I speak oh. French because so, oh. <laughs> the time, so yes, uh, I, I became French neurosurgeon. Uh, uh, so to do radio surgery. So I experienced over 1,000 cases in Marseille, France. So uh, I, I was a participating in the functional courses uh, four or five times. So uh, when you show the massive pictures, so I remember a good memory in the massive France and so treatment neuralgia treatment. <laughs> so uh, I have a several comments and questions. So uh, the first of all, the indication of gamma research or treatment neuralgia. So if the patient with a very severe treatment neuralgia, the patient can come to us. And so uh, what is the best indication using gamma radio surgery for the patients? What is your opinion? I think actually is uh, uh, the, the first indication is patient choice after we have given the options of the various treatment like including uh, MVD, unless they are too old and uh, we think that they cannot undergo anesthesia because of other general uh, bad general medical conditions. Mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, we will give them the options. Usually, we give the options of either whether they, they would like to undergo gamma knife or not, or try microvascular decompression. Uh, usually, I, I don't recommend a visceral injection, actually. Uh, that's not in our training. Um, and uh, I have uh, seen a um, quite number of cases uh, after the glycerol injection and fail, and uh, the, they are bad, not so favorable results were obtained after gamma knife or even MVD. Mm -hmm. Glycerol injection and the micro, uh, micro band compression is uh, some of the invasive treatment or treatment in the for carcinian ganglion cell. So uh, when I have a patient with treatment neurology, the time so uh, I suggest the patients uh, taking tegretol. Uh, so this is enough or not. After that, if the patient and not so uh, good control of, uh, only with the tegretol, the time so we'd like to recommend MBD. Uh, less than 75 years old, years, but more than 75 years old. So uh, the risk of the MBD during an operation, the patient has some risk. So the time, so uh, we want to recommend the radio surgery for the patients. So because radio surgery itself, so you mentioned about the papers and the, your uh, original data. The, I have the, some uh, problem uh, regarding digital cytotrigia neuralgia. So uh, effective uh, yields. So 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, we don't know very well. Probably uh, effects duration is around 10 years, I think so. So if a patient 60, 50 years old, uh, when we choice radio surgery, the patients are easier, ha easier to have to uh, recurrence with using neuralgia. So uh, elderly or MBD is not so effective. 
So uh, I think radio surgery is a last hope, the treatment for trigeal neuralgia. This is my uh, impression. How about you? Well, well actually, yeah, the, I actually, it's agreed that the first line of treatment is medical. Actually, usually when uh, the patient uh, has failed medical treatment or they really they have uh, allergic reactions to medic mm -hmm. or cannot tolerate the medications only that we go on to suggest other modality of treatment. I've yeah. been doing MVD all the while actually until mm -hmm. actually Gamma Knife came in. But still, I still offer surgery uh, as options and by make, making very clear to the patients of the pros and cons surgery versus you know possibility of gamma knife I, I totally agree on what you say on gamma and radio surgery okay okay the next one uh, we'd like to discuss about the target so uh, Marseille France and they wanted to use the target uh, as a retrogastrian and uh, on the other hand the Pittsburgh group Dr. Professor Konjulka uh, recommend uh, root entry zone. So uh, nowadays, uh, so this is a personal communication with a person conjurka. So now they wanted to shift to the style of Marseille France. Probably nowadays in the world, retrogastrian uh, targeting is a better for the neurology retro surgery. What do you think well, about it? Uh, actually, I'm also trained to some extent by Pittsburgh group. Uh, by Konsilka. Um, I think uh, the bulk of uh, evidence from all the papers and also experience is that the treatment at the retrogastrian site is actually probably being preferred. Uh, and also basically based on the results, actually they are obtained, they are more favorable. But as uh, what uh, Regis group has shown that actually the, the length or the distance of the target from the brainstem is important as well. Yes, yes. So some patient might not be at the pure retro uh, gasserian zone, but it has to be nearer towards the uh, brainstem, being at least uh, between seven to eight millimeter from the uh, brainstem mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to, to have better results. So complication point of view, the length between the target and the brainstem emergence point is very important. So Professor Zizi said, so brainstem should be less than 18, 18 gray, one eight gray. Mm -hmm. So if the more than one uh, 18, 18 gray, then the patient's easier to have a complication of cerebral surgery. So on the other hand, efficacy point of view, uh, gastrian ganglion involvement is not so good. So cerebral surgery, effective point of view, so the fiber, trigeminal fiber, targeting is very important. So Professor Reddy said and the uh, uh, same opinion of me. So the, you mentioned about, so six to seven millimeter from emergence of the brainstem, the target cell. So microanatomy point of view, so trigeminal nerve has three components. One is sensory root, one is inferior motor root, one is sensory uh, superior motor root. Uh, in the papers, inferior motor roots, there is between 10 and 20% uh, of the uh, sensory fibers. So uh, we, we cannot miss uh, the targeting of the inferior motor root. So inferior motor root is just a uh, huge, uh, about six millimeter from emergence of brainstem. So it means six or seven millimeter distances so not only complication point of view, but also effective point, uh, point of view. So sensory root and the uh, inferior motor root, the covering all. So uh, I think so the anatomical point of view, so this target is, um, uh, is the best uh, in my opinion. Yes. And the next one is the, uh, you won't use CT scan, uh, during the treatment? Well, actually, I, uh, we have, a, I use a both MRI and CT scan for you scan. Know, better localization, actually, to avoid any uh, mistake. Uh, in all my cases, actually, I do, I do use CT scan. 
confusion. So sometimes the MRI has a easy to have a distortion. So yes. CT scan has yes. no distortion. Yes. So that you are very well. So the uh, fusion images, CT and MRI is uh, the best uh, condition for the trigeminal neurological treatment. Agree. Do you think so that? Yeah. Yes. And so you uh, you have a lot of experience, not only gamma knife, but also uh, cyber knife and X knife, you said. So yes. what what is the difference between gamma knife, cyber knife, treating planning point of view? Uh, you mean in terms of uh, trigeminal neurology? Yes. Well, I think I still <laughs> think that well, gamma knife is very precise, actually. Of course, there are newer form of, uh, you know, uh, linear based uh, radio surgery, which I am still doing, like the two beam hyper arc, but that is only reserved for you know lesions that are bigger or which require fractions. I prefer gamma knife uh, for small lesion that uh, can be uh, treated for with single shot. Um, I think in the treatment of a uh, trigeminal neuralgia. I don't think we can use uh, any other form of uh, radio surgery. Mm. So now in your hospital, you have icon systems. Yes. That's right. Yes. Icon yes. systems, I know, we don't, uh, sorry, uh, we use uh, frame application. We can use mask applica application. So when you have the patient with your neuralgia, you want to treat with frame. Well, with a mask. I always uh, treat with a uh, frame for precision. Frame. Yes, mm -hmm. I will not compromise on that usually. Okay. Frame uh, application. Actually, there's no the compromise. Rest. No compromise. Okay. Yes. And uh, so next one is and the mechanism, actual mechanism of trigeminal neuralgia. So this is not, not so clear uh, until yet. So uh, what do you think about why radio surgery for trigeminal neuralgia is effective? What do you think about the mechanism? I think we, um, although there are some uh, mechanism like, uh, you know, uh, sub necrosis causing changes that might uh, interrupt the, uh, that uh, re causing some relief. Uh, I think the um, main mechanism that we, uh, based on the fact that many patients has no sensory changes following gamma knife, the more most likely the mechanism is a form of modulation in the changes of the uh, you know the uh, local biochemistry and uh, leading on to the functional change following uh, gamma knife treatment. Mm -hmm. So in my limited experience. The patients with neuralgia after radio surgery, excellent cases, easy to have the numbness. Or recurrence case is very less of num numbness. What do you think about that in your case? Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the uh, so far, actually, uh, we are lucky that in, in my uh, personal experience of not too big a case, I mean, the series mm -hmm. still, the numbness only happened in a few, really a few patients. Some are, most of them really are minimal, um, even in the, the, the first treatment, unless they have a prior treatment like restraw injection. Um, but, uh, you know, for retreatment, uh, if the, the limited number of cases that I had, in fact, I agree with you, in fact, they, they are not worried about numbness. In fact, they didn't uh there is no uh, complaint of numbness at all following retreatment mm -hmm. and uh, i reviewed the paper not only clinical but also the basic researches and uh, we have the one hypothesis for trigeminal neuralgia in radio surgery and probably there is two effects so one is early effect the one is delayed effect the early effects is that so Epaptic transmission blockage triggered by gamma radio surgery for the trigeminal nerve itself. So this effect arises between zero and six months later to radio surgery. So some cases, about 15% of the case of trigeminal neuralgia after radio surgery, immediately the trigeminal neuralgia was gone. 
And uh, about half of the patients, after six months later to radio surgery, small recurrence in the patient experience. So probably delayed effect, secondary effect is small axon degeneration. That time the patients are easy to have the facial numbness. So a facial numbness, the patient experience up, uh, on the, uh, between six and nine months. So uh, this is an, uh, according to our cases. So now I, I have so this hypothesis for radio surgery for treating neuralgia. So yes. And uh, uh, okay. And the uh, last uh, comment. So uh, when we, we have a patient with treating neuralgia very severely, so and uh, MBD or uh, the other treatment is not so uh, good for the patients. That time we have to choice gamma radio surgery for treatment in neurology itself. The time so that we are considering so long time long term uh, follow up. What's what? So if uh, the two points the one is efficacy. So initially up more than ninety percent. It's okay, but three years, five years, yeah. 10 years more. So the recurrence rate is what? So maybe depend on, on the uh, hospital, but so we'd like to know uh, duration of the efficacy. Second point is the complication. So complication is not so small so in your presentation and uh, in my experience. So about 25% of the, uh, the patients experienced a numbness, facial numbness after the surgery, and 10% around, uh, precisely 12.5% of the patients in our 400 cases to the neurology cases experienced very, very severe bothersum. So uh, the patients before radio surgery, no facial numbness, no bothersum. So if we'd like to treat radio surgery to the patients. Uh, I'm anxious about the patient easy to have the patient numbers and bothersome. So what do you think about longer follow-up for the patients? <laughs> well, I agree that patient, all these patients has to be follow up actually in the long term and uh, see whether they develop these complications or not. Mm. And uh, so now I'm just and researching in, in our institute. So uh, at least 10 years for up, now we have 103 cases, a median 16 years for up. So this is tentative results, pain-free, still 60%. So it means 30% recurrence, numbness 35%, so 10% more. But surprisingly, very bothersome, but this is only 3%. Initially, 12%, but 10 years more, 3%. It means after they do surgery, the bothersome had a chance to improve. So now uh, I'd like to uh, give this information to all the patients with arterial neurology patients. Uh, probably so, so these results I'd like to present uh, the coming WSSF meeting in uh, Seoul, uh, mm -hmm. 2022. Uh, I already, uh, I was already invited to have a lecture presentation, uh, radio surgery of the neurology. So uh, I'd like to discuss this uh, comment and in, in the conference. So yes, glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. So the, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Chi. So your experience and uh, your review the, the papers, uh, you have a lot of educational and slides, and uh, I'm very enjoyable from your presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for your lectures. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you very much, both the speaker and chair. It was indeed a very exhausting and wonderful presentation. We learned a lot from both of you. We can take a few questions if. One question from yes. Zamzuri. Okay, bro. Yes. Uh, yeah, concerning, uh, concerning the complete surgery after gamma knife radio surgery. 
what, what, what sort, of, sort of treatment you give to this patient with a severe numbness, bothersome numbness? You mean numbness after surgery? After gamma knife, after gamma knife. The bothersome numbness, hypoesthesia or... Well, actually, if there's a real numbness uh, following radio surgery, I don't think that there's any treatment. Uh, if uh, pro uh, Professor Hayashi will agree, uh, other than uh, some medical treatment, um, I don't think uh, there's uh, any uh, surgical uh, maneuver or any medication. I mean, procedure can alter the any numbness. For, yeah. Any role for re, re gamma knife? <laughs> no, it, I mean, you're talking about numbness that appear following radio surgery. Yeah. So I think, I think right. these are the cases that actually I would be skeptical to uh, uh, treat this patient with gamma knife again. Uh, um, for a patient that had undergone, uh, had developed uh, um, severe numbness, especially with other form of radio surgery. And uh, I, I have an answer. To, so if the patient has a if the patient has a bothersome numbness, uh, I'd like to prescribe the pregabalin to the patients. The pregabalin is very effective for the this kind of the continuous and uh, the pain so related to the damage of the trigeminal nerve itself. So trigeminal neuralgia is not a pain. Trigeminal neuralgia is a uh, like epilepsy. So, uh, uh, to neuralgia itself, medication point of view, Tegretol is the best choice. Pregabalin is not so effective for the trigeminal neuralgia itself. But after radio surgery, so this is atypical facial pain, it's easier to have the effect uh, with the pregabalin. And so that we derive the communication with the patients, uh, mental condition, or the psychological condition, uh, so continue uh, of the very good communication between doctors and the patients. So this is uh, one of the very important points. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very well, much. actually, the, to, to, to mention that also to clarify, I think communication is important. Uh, there are some patients that describe uh, what we understand is numbness, but yep. they are actually having a paresthesia or, you know, dysesthesia. And for this yeah. patient, of course, then uh, you should be uh, giving the uh, GABA pen, uh, GABA type of medications mm -hmm. for relief. And uh, many patients are improved with that. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not really numbness. Actually, when they describe, sometimes it's a language uh, yeah. that they yeah. use. Yeah, OK. Right. Thank you very much. We can take one last question from Professor Liu Bun Seng before we move on to the second session. Yes, Thank Liu. Thanks, Professor Chi, for a very nice presentation. I just want to find out for the patient that you do a retreatment, uh, uh, and you mentioned that uh, most of your patients you targeted the retoral uh, acid. Would you uh, choose another, uh, near to the uh, root entry zone uh, for, for retreatment, or you still use the same target? And uh, what do you, what's your opinion uh, in terms of using hypofractionated? Uh, whether is this better or do you have any experience on that? Thank you, Professor. Yes, uh, about retreatment, usually we don't treat on the same target. Uh, uh, actually, uh, usually my target actually is more proximal compared to the previous target. We have to know where is the previous target. They say which site is the, even if it's a retro -gesserian. But usually it's uh, more proximal at the lower dose. Usually I'll use about 70 gray at uh, just uh, more proximal. And uh, that seems to uh, give uh, very good results to patients. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. It was indeed a wonderful session. In that yeah. case, we'll move on to the second chair. Our honored guest, Professor Ahmad Ammar, would say a short introduction and then invite Professor Nakajima for his lecture. Professor Ammar, all yours. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I really enjoyed very much the uh, first session, uh, the lecture of Dr. She was, was excellent. You know, it was 
uh, overview of the whole problems. And uh, I actually, I enjoyed very much as well uh, Dr. Hayashi comments. And it was very educational and very experienced way of comments. And so this is a, both of them actually give us a very important and educational uh, session. So thank you. Thanks for both of uh, Dr. Rushi and Dr. Hayashi. Now we go for the second uh, lecture. I, it is an honor to present Dr. Madoka Nakajima from uh, <coughs> Gentundo uh, University in Tokyo. It's the famous university. And I could see that his Dr. Nakajima has been involved with in the management of hydrocephalus and the epilepsy for a long time. And I think he is going to tell us today about really very good idea. It has been there sometimes and then disappeared and maybe coming again about the use of lumboproteinal shunt for idiopathic uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So please, Dr. Nakajima, we are looking forward to see you and you will have a lot of questions after that, I guarantee. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. The member of Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Thank you for inviting me to this meeting. Today, I will talk about the lumbar peritoneal shunt. The LP shunt is relatively easy for patients to accept and has solid evidence as a treatment for INPH and is the most commonly used treatment for INPH in Japan. Today, I would like to review the LP shunt from the fundamental point of view again and share the actual treatment process while watching the VTR and also think about the future prospect. So, LP shunt, an extension of the lumbar puncture technique used in CSF exclusion test, is an increasingly popular treatment option in Japan. It has very small and not visible post-operative scars by crosses and no intervention to the brain. In Symphony 2, the LP shunt demonstrated its usefulness as a treatment for INPH with high evidence level. The risk of symptomatic intraparenchyma hematoma from the ventricular catheter placement, which is roughly 1%, in a patient with INPH is never present with LP shunt use. As not being frequently used in some part of the world, the technique has been often misunderstood for effectiveness and the void as a surgeon were not familiar with it. Today, I will present some points that can make you re-explore this option as INPH treatment. I will talk on developmental history of LP shunt, indications, and contraindications, surgical steps, complications, and post-operative management. There are different historical attempts until reaching the present solution. The Ferguson 1898 for the first time connected the subarachnoid space with the abdominal cavity using a silver wire passing through the hole drilled on the vertebral lamina. The Cushing 1926 reported 12 cases and the going shunt using the silver coated shunt tube. And Matson made a ultrastomy connecting with a plastic tube from the vertebral canal. But nevertheless, due to the obvious holdings rupture and obstruction of the shunt tubes, the plastic tube and LP shunt were indeed abandoned. With the improvement of the shunt tube materials, as well as the emergence of shunting devices, equipped with the bulb, the usage of the LP shunt gradually became widespread. In addition, these LP shunt placement were performed by open method of the vertebral arch dissection. The closed method was first performed by the Jackson and Snodgrass, 1955. Then 
The spitzler and the corner perform the simple pack tunnels efficient using the silicone tube instead of other plastic materials to avoid these complications. The Symphony 2, a prospective March center trial to assess LP shunt treatment in a patient with INPH, which integrated a three month randomized control trial comparing the LP shunt treatment to conservative therapy, and the 12 month extension period in which all subjects received the LP shunt and were examined for 12 months following the implantation. The short term and long term beneficial effects of LP shunt use were obvious and were reported. Then the LP shunt is increasingly being used in Japan and suffers the VP shunt use. These were the general indication and contraindications that were applied. We will check proper INPH diagnosis, general patient condition, tap test result, whole spine imaging, abdominal lesion exclusion. Now I would like to show you the VTR of the actual surgery that we are performing for each specific surgical steps. Step 1. Surgical preparation. The patient received either lumbar or general anesthesia. General anesthesia is required for laparoscopic catheter placement in the abdominal cavity as it required insufflation. In our hospital, we use isobaric bupivacaine for lumbar anesthesia. Antibiotics are administered intravenously prior to surgery to prevent infection. LP shunt surgery is performed in the lateral position. A cushion should be placed under the armpit to relieve pressure on the upper arm. The lower legs should be gentle bent and the cushion should be placed between the knee so that the patient can be maintained a comfortable and relaxed posture without arching the back. If you use a full scope such as a C arm to check the position of the catheter during the surgery, ensure that the full scope can be moved to the puncture site or to the spinal level for being able to guide the catheter tip before setting it. Adjust the bed by slightly lifting the head side to the widen the lumbar subarachnoid space for the ease of lumbar puncture. Since the skin sags when the patient is turned from the supine to the lateral position, preoperative marking is performed to draw a skin incision line in the supine position and secure the delay point and abdominal cavity. Since it is difficult to identify adhesions in the abdominal cavity by preoperative diagnostic imaging, the side of the abdominal cavity that has not undergone laparotomy should be selected as much as possible. Step 2. Lumbar side. Guide the spinal catheter through the lumbar puncture using a toughy needle. There are two puncture approaches, median puncture and paramedian puncture. The lumbar spine of the older adult tends to be deformed and for patients with narrow interspinous processes, paracentral puncture is recommended. Because median puncture may cause post-operative tube rupture. The findings of the spinal CT and MRI should be reviewed in preoperative puncture planning. Make an incision of approximately 10 mm in depth and 2 cm laterally on the lumbar side. 
having confirmed the outflow of CSF after the puncture, rotate the puncture needle so that the insert shunt tube is directed cranially, and insert the shunt tube into the lumbar subarachnoid space extending 2-3 vertebra above. If the tip of the caster extend outward or bent to the form U-turn, it may induce the postoperative spinal root symptoms and cause lower limb pain. Therefore, adjustment must be done for the caster to be placed in the midline under the fluoroscopy. Shunt bar placement. Set up a relay point in the lateral abdomen. LP shunt are the prone to caster dislodgement, which may be caused by bending or twisting at the waist. Try to fix the shunt system in at least three sides, lumbar, ventral, and lateral abdominal to prevent dislodgement. In case of abdominal placement, create a tunnel between the lateral abdominal relay point and the skin incision for laparotomy and subcutaneous implant the shunt bar. In this case, make sure that it keeps flat and the depth of the shunt bar is 7 to 10 mm from the skin. We fix the shunt bar at least two points on each side to dumps with a non-absorbable thread. If it is too deep, it is difficult to post-operatively change the set pressure. And if it is too shallow, the risk of infection increases. Since the shunt valve may rotate sideways and flip, it is important to always fix the shunt valve to fasture at two or more points or to the dermis if the subcutaneous fat is thick to prevent it from moving. In case of back implantation of the shunt valve, the stability after implantation secures by the paramedian muscle group and advantage. The stability of implantation reduces the chance of rotation and the reversal of the shunt valve and make it easy to change the pressure setting of the programmable valve. Flushing of the valve can also be performed as needed. Step for abdominal side. The procedure can be undertaken in the following two ways, lateral or supine position, and you can use the method familiar to you. When changing positions, it is convenient to use a transportation board. The abdominal wall incision is normally made use the McBurney technique, and the length of the skin incision is determined by the thickness of the abdominal fat layer. From the post-operative cosmetic perspective, it is advisable to approach the patient using an intersecting incision site along the skin recruited line so that the underwear can hide the near horizontal skin incision site. If abdominal operation is the performed the lateral position and if the patient is obese, special attention is needed as the surgical field become deep and the patient's own weight cause the abdominal to droop downward, allowing the incision to be made only toward the umbilical direction, causing the disorientation. The incision should be made down to the external oblique fasture to prevent the percutaneous fat from melting and creating dead space. The use of blank hook and the monster self-retaining retractor provide a shallow surgical field by pulling the superficial abdominal fasture and anterior surface 
of the rectus abdominis sheath of blood, allowing easy surgical access. The lower abdomen has three muscle layers, external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis that run in an alternating manner. Inside the dissect, the muscle groups run free, while trying to preserve the fiber along their cords and pull the rectus abdominis muscle medially from its lateral border to expose the transverse fascia and peritoneal wall. Make an incision by catching up the fascia and peritoneum with forceps to separate them from the instant to avoid damaging it and secure the abdominal cavity. A fascia gapping is a useful technique to prevent exposure of the caster on anterior seas of the rectus abdominis muscle by preventing the caster to be pulled out of the abdominal cavity and making a loop. Connect the lumbar caster shunt valve and peritoneal caster to complete the shunt system and confirm spontaneous cerebrospinal fluid flow from the peritoneal caster chip. Then, insert the caster into the abdominal cavity. Since the patient growth needs are not taken into account, the length of the caster to be inserted into the abdominal cavity need only to be within a range that does not allow dislodgement after the twisted the waist. We use a shorter length to fit the patient body shape, averaging approximately 15 to 20 cm. Post-operative management. The patient can eat from the evening of the day of the surgery. Exercise rehabilitation is normally allowed on the next day after the surgery. However, owing to the difference the diameter between the caster and the taffy needle, lumbar puncture needle, there is a high chance of cerebrospinal fluid leakage from the lumbar subarachnoid space to the epidural space immediately after the surgery. If neurological symptom suspected to be caused by low cerebrospinal fluid pressures, such as occipital pain, dizziness, and floating sensation appear after the surgery, bed rest may be necessary. A lumbar puncture and caster placement are the most important techniques for safe and accurate efficient treatment. Intraoperative confirmation and fluoroscopy is the most accurate method. It is also possible to avoid complications where the catheter tip is misplaced into the subdural space. In this case, the contrast medium injected through the caster is seen to remain localized. Complication if the puncture is done blindly, 60% of the placements were higher than the intended location. Complications related to shunt, problems with lumbar casters, and over drainage are the most common, followed by abdominal caster problems. To prevent over drainage, our data suggested that the LP shunt system with a programmable valve with gravity valve has the potential to suppress the standing flow and provide sufficient superinflow volume. Post-operative pressure setting. In the immediate post-operative period, we start with high pressure setting for all cases, considering the presence of CSF leakage to extradural space. We lower the setting by 2-3 cm H2O at the time by referring to the condition of high convexity sulci, their patency. When there is a suspicion of shunt failure on our patient, it is effective to check the shunt patency by puncturing the reservoir with 27G 
needle. In conclusion, in the diagnosis and treatment of hydrocephalus, it is a prerequisite to ensure that shunting is performed without surgical complications. Because of lack of evidence from the literature on LP shunting techniques and the standardization among centers, it was not possible to conduct a systematic review to determine the optimal technique. With attention to safe and reliable techniques, we hope that LP shunt will be widely and effectively applied to the patient without any differences in outcomes among surgeon and centers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nakajima, for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, presentation and showing us the technique. Actually, there are few questions I have and in mind. First of all, we have um, some experience with uh, lumbobrotrinal shunt. Uh, we do it mo more commonly in the cases of pseudotumor cerebri and high intracranial pressure, more than we do it in lumbobrotrinal shunt. But we do, as usual, that is the uh, Hakim test and uh, lumbar drainage for a while before the normal pressure happens. I'm, going to I'm not going to discuss about the basophysiology of global pressure hydrocephalus or pubasic because this is, will take us to another little concentrate of the first question I have. <clears throat> Do you think because most of the patients with idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus are old age, senile age, sometimes that is they have a sort of the vertebrae itself is osteophytes, uh, a degree of canal stenosis and this thing. Do you think that it's, uh, you, did you find some difficulties for such a group of patient to do just lumbar puncture, uh, stove needle, or you should open, or if you face the situation, you have to open and do fenestration in order to insert the tip of the cassette? This okay. is the first question. Okay. So if severe spinal degeneration uh, is confirmed by uh, MRI. So I needed spine surgery is better to the, be performed in advance, uh, followed by the shunt treatment for hydrocephalus. So if spinal surgery is not needed, uh, we will perform the VP shunt uh, with a appropriate patient consent. Okay. So, <coughs> So you are before inserting it, you decide you are going to do either lumbar uh, insertion, lumbar uh, puncture insertion or open. That is fair enough. Second question mm -hmm. about the location of the tip of the shunt, the length of the intrathecal part of the shunt. I could see from your drawing and so you always try to locate it upward in the, till the dorsal or lower lung. Have you tried to get it the opposite way, sacral down, instead of getting the tip up to direct the tip down? Because we tried this. Did you try it? Uh, sometimes uh, the ca caster might be uh, uh, down, downward. Yes. Uh, the pa uh, patient uh, will be uh well, we will we have uh, uh, leg pain sometimes uh, uh we experience this so i uh try to uh, uh locate the caster the upward uh two three uh uh this uh two, two, two three uh, upward then uh, we tried uh, uh, the caster appraisement uh, under the fluoroscope. So the, the center of the uh, spinal canal, uh, we uh, didn't experience uh, the patient uh, leg pain. 
So now we are always uh, to do the best position to the center of the spinal canal. Yeah. Then, mm. I agree with you. When mm. The best, the only guarantee is to be in the center as much as possible. Mm. But we have cases really when we locate it upward to T3, I mean to dorsal area, they still mm. have some back pain. Mm -hmm. I think you have the sub cases like that. Mm -hmm. So you you uh, you check the the located catheter, mm -hmm. the by the X ray. Yeah. Uh huh. Zoom. Okay. <clears throat> Second, because I see that the, our uh, respected uh, colleagues they also would like to ask about valve fixation. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought you wrote different things. I would like to know your favorite ways, because in my very limited experience now, because we have type of patient may be different, very big patient, big belly. That is sometimes that is if you put the valve in the belly, you will not trace it. You don't know if it's functional or not. So we try like to fix it around the iliac crest before mm -hmm. going to the abdomen. Do you, so that is. What is your experience about fit? Because I saw in your drawing, you leave it in the, you know, in the iliac area, but not fix it to the iliac crest. But we try to fix it to the iliac crest, at least so we have a way to test it, to know it is functioning, not functioning, flushing back or not flushing back. Because when it is in the abdomen, you will never be able to do that. Yes. Uh, of course, uh, uh, if we need to uh, pump, pump, pumping, yes. Uh, yeah. We in, uh, if we uh, think that need needed the pumping, uh, mm -hmm. on we try to uh, fix the on the iliac bone, but uh, I I don't think. Uh, uh, the air patient uh, is not necessary. Uh, the pumping, uh, we check the the puncture of puncture the valve, then uh, with the uh, CSF, so that the pat the patent uh, the patency of the uh, shunting system. So. And uh, you you know that the Japanese patient is the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the, the iliac bone, uh, on the on the iliac bone, uh, the patient complained the uh, the pain. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we now we uh, look at uh, we uh, put the the valve on uh, the uh, abdominal side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, last question. I think that this is a good idea in on the iliac <laughs> bone. That uh, that yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I actually with I am in our people that is here, this big people, and so it is. It's not only to flush bubbling or flushing it regularly, mm -hmm. but for example, if you see the patient clinically deteriorating. For, and this is typical for uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, and you would like to be sure shunt is working or not working. So this is one of the easiest way to test the shunt, not for any other reason. Mm -hmm. My uh, very uh, last questions about uh, the rate of infection. You didn't cite in the complication. How much is the rate of infection and how long do you keep the patient? You said you give before the operation preparation antibiotics, but how long do you keep give antibiotic after the uh, operation and the rate of complications Thank infection uh, yeah i uh, my experience uh, experience the infection cases are most of the 1% of the patient so these cases uh, uh, the, they have uh, uh, diabetes and uh, very uh, very thin same cases uh, we need to uh, the valve and the shunt system under the skin that oh, oh, 
about the 10 a millimeter under the skin. This is a, a protected infection. Uh, then I uh, always use the antibiotics uh, after the shunt, uh, the three, four days, uh -huh. very good. Uh, twice a day. Yeah, that is very good. Well, if anyone uh, has any questions. Definitely, I have two questions with Professor Nakajima. Thank Professor Nakajima, thank you very much. It was indeed a very wonderful lecture. Thank you very much for that. I would like to inquire with you, what is your experience with regard to El Pishant in local anesthesia as mm -hmm. done by Professor Kawahara, who has the largest series for El Pishant under local anesthesia. Why do you prefer GA or general anesthesia or lumbar anesthesia? Okay. I, I, I tried the, the under the local anesthesia. Uh, you, I, I uh, the, this case of the publishment of the JNS 2011, uh, we exp our experience in the 40 cases under the local anesthesia. But uh, now uh, we use the, uh, the rumbar, rumbar anesthesia. Uh, because the of the the, the patient the, uh, needed the, the open the of the abdominal cavity. Uh, my my all the experiences that the forty cases are the just the uh, puncture uh, the abdominal, and uh, we use the the. Uh, the PWACs and the catheter uh, inserted. But now uh, we opened the uh, ab uh, abdominal side. Uh, you, 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 uh, we sh we, uh, I show you. Uh, th these cases that needed the local anesthesia. Uh, uh, no, 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 lumbar anesthesia. Uh, you, you, <laughs> I you understand, understand this. Understood. Uh, Another question uh, is that uh, when, when your patient, uh, uh, first of all, let me ask you, have you had any complications of subdural hematoma? Because elder, uh, is very common in elderly and your lumbar drainage may accentuate it. So have you had any cases where you had a patient after El patient discovered a subdural hematoma? Yeah. The subdural uh, hematoma is a very important complications. Uh, the immediate after immediate, uh, the surgery, uh, the lumbar uh, punctures the the leaked uh, uh, the CSF uh, the with the load uh, the puncture puncture hole that then the uh, one month or two months after the surgery uh, we try to the uh, the valve setting the, the low low pressure uh, sometimes we experience uh, the subdural uh, effusion uh, we 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 try to check the the one month uh, uh, after the surgery and then the CT by CT scanning. Uh, a couple of months after the surgery, we mm, uh, tried the CT scan more. Uh, then the patient sometimes uh, complained the headache. Uh, this is a, a very a important sign, the warning the sign, uh, the subdural hematoma. So we need a, uh, uh, the some a patient uh, complain the headache. We try to the, the valve setting up upside. Um, so you uh, we sh we show you the uh, the 
uh, siphon guard system and uh, gravity valve uh, and, uh, protect the, the subdural hematoma. Uh, now uh, we uh, experience that uh, type of the uh, subdural hematoma with some complications, uh, very de decreasing. Uh, with the uh, the uh, gravity valve. And this tree. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Professor Chi Chi Pin, would you like to comment or ask something? Well, actually, uh, lumbar peritoneal shunt has been uh, very useful in certain selected patients. But uh, I do have some reservation in some other patients if you are talking about you know, routine use in a normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, uh, in, say, in fact, many cases, our, if the ventricle is slightly larger, uh, rather uh, instead of VP shun instead. Although those cases that I have used uh, LP shun does help in many patients. Um, uh, also, I target the, the, the tube this, uh, approximately upwards instead of going down because they are worried about, you know, the tube is irritating the uh, corda equina, causing un unnecessary symptoms to the patients. Actually, I don't think they will like it, you know, causing paresthesia or what in the, in the legs or what. Um, antibiotics, I think we use, uh, I use usually about at least, at least three days. Um, and uh, I, instead of puncturing uh, blindly using the, you know, the percutaneous way to the abdomen, uh, rather open up the peritoneal cavity and make sure that the tube actually is sitting nicely instead actually uh, to prevent any obstruction distally. Uh, I think that's important actually. There's no point to have, uh, you know, block shunts actually uh, soon after the LP shunt. And you'd be wondering whether a technique is uh, having problem rather than uh, just the, uh, you know, adhesions uh, on the distal tubing actually due to the tube being inserted into the omentum. Uh, that's my comment. Right. Thank you very much, Professor Hayashi. Any comments from your side? No, <laughs> 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 My goes Libun saying. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Raja. Thank you, Professor Nakajima, for a very nice presentation. Hi. I just want to give a very provocative question. Uh, do you think that the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus is not a curable disease? Uh, simply uh, because uh, if you follow uh, long enough for the patient who pause a uh, shun, the improvement tend to be become less. And do you think that what's the reason why the improvement uh, become less over years? Is it due to uh, a new equilibrium between the cells and the brain that they cause a new new targeted uh, value for, for, for the pressure? Uh, secondly, do, or you, do you think that because of ongoing uh, vascular or neural degenerative that cannot be stopped by the uh, shunt procedure? Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, a very important point, the, <laughs> the treatment of the INPH. Uh, we try to the uh, uh, yeah the patient background that kind of the com comorbidity. Mm. This is a very important and very hard to the <laughs> recognize the patient. Yeah, very important points. We try to. Thank you, Professor. Thank Professor, you can I comment? Yes, yes. Because uh, actually we did uh, some research and we published in the book about this, uh, try to explain what is the uh, of physiology of normal pressure hydrocephalus and try to, un uh, to answer this clearly question, why it is progressive dynamic. What we find actually from the study, which included taking biopsy from the cortex and subcortical uh, tissue mm -hmm. in such cases, this is always mirrors infarction. So this is a problem actually, as we said, that is, it is starting with the venous infarction, and this is will uh, be reflected as what we call a stiffness of the subcortical in the white matter connection between the mm -hmm. uh, cortex and the, uh, around the ventricles. And this is itself, which is 
going to interfere with the alternative pathway, which will always progress. It is not the it's not the volume of it, or the pressure of the ICP which is making, but the absorption mm -hmm. of the ICP finally to the PNF system a long long uh, pathway which is a cause. So if really we are talking about, we shouldn't concentrate only on the CSF, on the pressure to reduce the valve or not to reduce the valve. We have to think more. We have to think about, yes, this is one step, but with it, we, go, we have to think about the venous drainage of the whole brain. And this is, can really help a little bit. I don't say this is the final, but it is, we, I, I believe, strongly believe and proved, and others are also talking about it, the venous circulation playing a very important role in this normal pressure hydrocephalus. Thank you. I agree with you. Very much. It is <laughs> very wonderful and insightful thought. Yes, Professor Amzuri Dritz. Oh, yeah, I just, just want to say, uh, Prof Nakajimi shows a very nice pictures on the incision of the catheters, where he mentioned about the uh, lateral uh, sagittal, is it la lateral, lateral incision, uh, lateral mm -hmm. angle incision, uh, where you put it lateral, uh, just lateral to the spinous process. But I think that's very important to prevent from the fracture of, fracture of the shan uh, for, for the trainees here to appreciate that the lateral uh, angle uh, to get into the, into the tecker sac. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I think if there are no further questions, we can wind this up and hear the concluding remarks from Professor Ahmed Ammar. Well, thank you very much. Really, I uh, uh, I think this is the best end for my day. I had a long day in the outpatient clinic and I just came <laughs> running to attend. I enjoyed very much the first uh, session. Actually, I thoroughly I enjoyed the discussion mainly, and the overview of the trigeminal neurology. And I enjoyed very much that the presentation of Dr. Nakashima. It is really, it is, can show that is medicine and the surgical procedure as goes in fashion. Nothing old and will be obsolete. It comes again. With market improving and it comes again. That is proof. So actually, I believe there is a room for normal pressure, hydro, for lumbar proteinia shunt in some selected cases of normal pressure hydrocephalus. And uh, the technique which Dr. Nakajiba presented is very good technique. And I think it really, but needs more study. I mean, I, I hope that you can organize something like multi-center studies about such cases. Because the problem which you have, like I have, and maybe Professor Chi and uh, Dr. Hayashi and uh, Dr. Liu had, every one of us has not a large number of patients. But if we can work it together in some way or another, maybe Raja can present it, I'll, I'll learn it. And then we have a control and uh, strictly, strict uh, protocol. Then we maybe will come with some idea and see where we are. Personally, I like the idea of lumbobrotineal shunt in some cases. Uh, of normal pressure hydrocephalus when that is really the no obvious uh, venous thrombosis or no obvious problem. There is no <coughs> very large dilated of the lateral ventricles and there is no large space because I'm afraid of the complication of subdural hematoma if, uh, if we over drain. So it would be very nice if we can do multi-center study and see how we will go from it. But thank you very much, Dr. Nakajima. It was a wonderful, and uh, uh, you know that is, I love Japan with everything related to Japan. You know, I spend my one of my best for life with Professor Sugita in Japan, so it is very special part in my heart. <laughs> okay, and I think I visited university a long time ago when Dr. Oi was there. So anyhow. So thank you, uh, Dr. Raja, for this wonderful meeting and the gathering, and I hope to see you to each other again. But please consider multi-center study. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll wind this up officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito. I would like to thank both the speakers and chairs, Professor uh, Nakajima, Professor uh, uh, Chichi Pin, Professor, Mak um, Professor Hayashi, and Professor Ahmed Amar for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. 
Thank you very much indeed. A special thanks to Professor Shubin for supporting us in our educational ventures and broadcasting these webinars on the WeChat channel today in China. This webinar is also being broadcasted in YouTube, Zoom, and currently, as of now, we have 900 people who have joined us live. So we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for that. A special thanks to my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Singh, also for joining me today. So until we all meet again on the coming Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.